Shalom. This is Rabbi David Dubo with Midrashat Emuna Omanut, and this is another visual Devar Torah. Today I would like to explore Bilam and his power to curse. The Torah uses several words to describe cursing, but I believe one very specific word will open up this concept to us. We want to understand the form of cursing called Kava. When queried by God, Bilam explains Balak's request in the strong form of the verb to curse. Ata lecha kava lioto. Go now and curse them for me. Rashi explains on the spot, shuhu no cave umifaresh. Kava is from no cave, which means to specify. In order to make sense of this word, I want to turn to a different conversation using the same root, but with a very different sense. When Jacob, when Yaakov is, ex- is negotiating his exit package from Laban, his father-in-law, he makes the case that he's worked for years without putting away any money for himself and his family. Laban tries to settle the debt with finality and says, Yomar ve'nakva scharcha alai ve'etena. Specify your wage for me and I'll pay it. Nakva is the same root as kava. And Rashi, using the Targum, makes the connection between those two words and says it means to specify, be explicit about the amount. Yaakov refuses. He doesn't want to limit his worth to a one-time payout. Instead, he makes a plan with Laban to continue shepherding his sheep while agreeing that the mottled and speckled sheep and goats that will be born going forward will be for Yaakov, whereas the perfectly white and brown sheep and goats will belong to Laban. Laban agrees, thinking that this is a process clearly in his, fa- in his advantage because Yaakov's starting point is a flock free of all mottled and speckled animals. If like breeds like, then Yaakov stands to lose. But because Hashem is behind the process, all the births that follow favor Yaakov. Instead of limiting the value of the blessings that Yaakov brought to Lavan's flocks to a fixed sum, Yaakov, with Hashem's imprateur, engages an organic process that occurs over time and brings Yaakov tremendous wealth. Hazal teach that it's the nature of blessing. It comes to you when you don't look too closely, when you don't try to weigh and measure and sum it all up in a single moment. A rabbi is taught in Masechet Ta'anit, Tani Rabbanan, Hanichnas lemdo limod et no, a person who walks in to measure his uh, goren, his threshing floor, Omer, Yehi ratzon milfanecha Hashem elokeinu, May it be God's will that you will send a blessing. But if you've already started measuring, you have to say, Blessed be Hashem who already sent it. The rabbis teach, If you say, measure, and then ask for blessing. Blessing does not inhere in things that are measured or counted or weighed. This sounds like a sweet, almost fanciful idea. Close your eyes so that a shame can slip you a little extra when no one else is looking. But I would like to argue that this way of looking at the world actually reflects a hard-nosed, real scientific and mathematical interpretation of what curses might mean. Chazal and Masechet Sanhedrin Kuf He attribute Bilam's powers to curse, by being the master of knowing the exact split second of Hashem's anger. Bilam understood how to time his curse with that moment for maximum effect. A curse has a certain minor power to it. A negative word, a negative thought can have damaging effects. Bilam's efficacy was not the power of his curse, but knowing how well to apply it. Knowing Hashem's moment of anger is understanding the world the nature of certain processes and timing your efforts to take best advantage of the moment. I believe that understanding speaks to a modern and accurate understanding of how the physical world works. Usually, we imagine time, like all processes, marching along smoothly without any connection to human action or consciousness. Most familiar operations work with a linear relationship to time. Time spent relates to results achieved. Spend eight hours painting picket fences, and you get maybe four painted fences. Spend 16 hours, and you get eight painted fences. 
But certain operations have a logarithmic relationship between effort in and results out. Small, very well-timed pushes or pulls can change whole systems dramatically. This is what we call the butterfly effect. Now imagine the butterfly is a billum, and it knows exactly where and when to give a little puff of air that will eventually become a hurricane. This is new thinking, born of the mathematics of chaos. But I'd like to venture that it is also old thinking, understood by Atura in the ancient world of Bilam. It relates to how we understand celestial mechanics, how we describe, predict, and understand the motion of the heavenly bodies. One view of the heavenly bodies is to see them as a great machine, marching across the sky with clockwork precision. It is true that the moon can sometimes move faster and other times slower. Sometimes planets even appear to move backwards. But if we, under, if we uncover the underlying mathematical relationship, then it's not time that speeds up or slows down. It's the object accelerating under gravity or the relative motion of a planet making it appear to turn backwards. Time moves evenly and smoothly. The x-axis is still independent and everything can be plotted against time. This is true for the Ptolemaic model with its heavenly bodies attached to interconnected spheres of coordinated motion. And it's true for a simplified Newtonian Copernican model, with all the planets circling the sun with their own independent elliptical orbits. In both models, we can let the mathematic periods repeat, representing one year, 20 years, 10,000 years, or 100 million years. If we have measured things accurately today, we can plot where they all will be at some arbitrary time in the future. This idea of a clockwork solar system it's not just a fanciful image of how the universe works. This is a mathematical model based on rational relationships between all the moving parts that allows us to build an analog computer that can make real calculations. Look at this. It's a real orrery, a simple one. But the ancient Greeks built um, one that we found at, the, at a place called Antikythera. Uh, that device was so complicated that you could turn a crank and all the gears would turn around and let you know where planets and all sorts of things could be plotted anytime in the future or back in the past. Here we have the Earth, the Moon, the Sun, all rotating with clockwork precision. 365 turns of the Earth make 12 circles of the Moon all in one time around the Sun. It works until the Moon bumps into your nose. In this model of the universe, we are passive observers of a rational machine. Our actions have no effect on the outcomes of this grand universe. The problem is, and Newton already sensed this, you can't view the orbits of the planets as independent paths around the Sun. The gravity of Jupiter, for example, affects Earth. Once you start trying to calculate the mutual effects of gravity, all the elegance of Principia Mathematica falls apart and chaos enters the system. Newton understood this and believed that this was the role of divine providence to nudge all the planets back into their stable orbits. Leibniz laughed at him for that. But serious scientists today who have run numerical analysis on the solar system have this to say. It, so the difficulty is in predicting exactly where Jupiter will be 100 million years from now rather than the overall shape of its orbit. But the chaos is, is, is there, it's real. Uh, perhaps the most dramatic indication of the, uh, the importance of the chaos is that if you decide to go to the theater instead of staying home one night, the extra tidal force on Jupiter due to your decision from the motion of your body is sufficient to change the orbital position of Jupiter uh, so that it's completely unpredictable after a few hundred million years. So it, if ever there was a statement of the possible monumental consequences of a single human action, a curse, that was it. Theoretically, if you knew where and when to be, you could topple Jupiter from Mount Olympus. It doesn't matter that it's impossible to actually implement that curse. I think it's very significant that our scientific understanding allows for that, albeit theoretical, possibility. So 
Where can our decisions today actually have major repercussions on the future? Almost all living processes exhibit elements of chaos, of the butterfly effect. Here I mean chaos in the mathematical sense, not in the random lawlessness. It means that a very small change today can have huge effects in the future. This is the awareness a Jew should have about sin and repentance. A small mistake today can cascade affecting other people and snowball into something much larger, or the opposite. Think about a decision you made that led to other decisions and another that put you in a very different, unexpected place in your life's trajectory. Who we, are, who we marry is probably the most significant determinant in how our life turns out. But who we marry relates to what school we went to, or camp we attended, uh, or suggestion that we agreed to try. Now, let's look at the end of the Parsha. Bilaam doesn't succeed in directly cursing Am Yisrael, but he was behind the sexual temptations and subsequent fall into idolatry with the daughters of Moab and Midian that spelled disaster for Am Yisrael. This failure cascades until even the leadership participates. Pinchas mobilizes and strikes the sinful couple right through their bellies, the seat of their fertility. Instead of taking their power to build families that multiply far into the future, this couple curtailed the Jewish future by falling prey to assimilation. What's the name of that belly in Hebrew? El Kubata or El Kuba. It's the same root as that word to curse, Kavali. Our job in this world is to participate in the Shem's blessings through Torah and life building butterfly effects. May we all be Zoche to move worlds with our actions and build worlds with our families. I have many more thoughts about how our Parsha relates to mathematical ideas. I hope I will be able to provide some follow up videos that continue these ideas. Shabbat Shalom.